uh, says, I have everything I need for joy. His hands are twisted and his feet are useless. He can't bathe himself, he can't feed himself, he can't brush his teeth, comb his hair, or put on his underwear. Strips of Velcro hold his shirts together. His speech drags like a worn out audio cassette, if any of you know what that is. He has several palsy. The disease keeps him from driving a car, riding a bike, or even going for a walk. But it didn't keep him from graduating from high school or attending Abilene Christian University in Texas, from which he graduated with a degree in Latin. Latin. Having cerebral palsy didn't keep him from teaching at St. Louis Junior College or from venturing overseas on five mission trips. But Robert's disease didn't prevent him be from becoming a missionary in Portugal. He moved to Lisbon. A Lisbon, Portugal, in 1972, alone. There he rented a hotel room and began studying Portuguese. He found a restaurant order who would feed him in, at, after the rush hour and a tutor who would instruct him in the language. Then he stationed himself every day in a, in a park where he distributed brochures and pamphlets about Jesus. Within six years, he led 70 people to the Lord, one of whom became his wife, Rosa. Lucado said, I heard Robert speak recently. I watched other men carry him in his wheelchair out onto the platform. I watched them lay a Bible in his lap. I watched his stiff fingers force open the pages. And I watched people in the audience wipe away tears of admiration from their faces. Robert, Robert could have asked for their sympathy or pity, but he did just the opposite. He, he held his bent hand in the air and boasted, I have everything I need for joy. His shirts are held together by Velcro, but his life is held together with joy. The sermon last week spoke of peace, the peace that passes all understanding which is the peace that comes only from God. And this week, we've lit the candle of joy. When the angel announced the birth of Jesus in Jerusalem, he told the shepherd, I bring you good news that will bring joy to all people. The announcement is the embodiment of the gospel. It's what it's all about. The good news is the gospel. of the gospel is that salvation is offered to everyone through the gift of Jesus. Time now for another illustration. Tony Campolo uh, was another uh, Christian speaker and he tells a story about being in a church in Oregon when he was asked to pray for a man who had cancer. So Campolo, if you know Tony Campolo, and I, I actually got to meet him one time, he's was usually very self-assured and very confident in himself. Not arrogant, just confident. And so he prayed boldly uh, for this man's healing. The next week he got a, a telephone call from, from the man's wife. And she said, you prayed for my husband. He had cancer. And Camp Cam Campolo said when he heard the word had cancer, he thought that the cancer had been eradicated. But before he could think much about it, the woman said, he died. And he felt terrible. But she continued, don't feel bad. When he came into church that Sunday, he was filled with anger. He knew he was going to be dead in a short period of time, and he hated God. He, he was 58 years old. I'm 58 years old, by the way. And he wanted to see his children and his grandchildren grow up. He was angry at this all-powerful God didn't take away the sickness and, and heal him. He would lie in bed and he would curse God. The more his anger grew towards God, the more miserable he was to everybody around him. And, and he was just awful. It was awful to be in his presence. But the lady told Anthony Campolo, after you prayed for him, a peace came over him, 
and a joy came into him. She said, Tony, the last three days have been the best days of our lives. We've sung, we've laughed, we've read scripture, we prayed. They've been wonderful days. And I just called to thank you for laying your hands on him and praying for healing. And then she said something very profound. She said, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. I see that in the midst of, of intense suffering, in the midst of the worst kind of suffering, there can be joy. That woman understood something that we sometimes forget. We live in a culture where everybody needs to be happy. Don't be sad, be happy. We believe things will make us happy. We believe that the right relationship will make us happy. We believe that the latest gadget will make us happy. We believe that because that's what we're told. Movies and TVs and, and commercials on TV are filled with happy people who have all the right things. The problem with that is we know in our hearts and minds that things, even people, cannot bring permanent happiness. They can't because there is no such thing. We may have the best relationship in the history of the world but there will be times when you aren't happy with that other person. And things break. Things become outdated. And they are never what we believe them to be. I, I'm sorry, even the iPhone. <laughs> Remember the angel didn't promise happiness to the people who heard the good news. He promised them that it would bring joy. The birth of the Messiah was, was a happy event. But he would grow into a man that the Old Testament called the suffering servant. He was born to die. That was not a happy outcome for an originally happy event. The angel said the event would bring joy to all people. There's a difference, and it's a big difference. In the book of James, suffering and trials are directly connected with joy. Because of that, we gain a better understanding of the function of joy in the life of the Christian. I remember reading the first few verses of James many years ago and thinking, well, maybe James was just a little bit crazy. Why would a person be joyful over suffering and all kinds of trouble? I've kind of changed my mind since then. But when I think about trials, I think about Joseph and Mary in our story, our narrative of a Christmas season. Can you imagine the gossip, the looks, the stares as they went around their business, that went about their business? Remember, Mary was pregnant, unmarried, betrothed, but not married. Mary was growing larger by the day. I'm sure that little town of Nazareth was just a buzz with all kinds of rumors and gossip. What about Joseph? Did his business suffer? Was Mary ostracized in the marketplace when she went to buy food? Did her family reject her? And then the census of all times for the census to come. Mary's at full term and had to travel to Bethlehem from Nazareth. It was 110 kilometers from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Well, it still is today, actually. They're not any closer. Both villages still exist. And, yet, and the trip that Joseph and Mary took might have even been further because it was unlikely that Jewish people would have traveled from Galilee through Samaria down into Judea. They would have probably traveled across the Jordan River around Samaria and down 
into Judea that way. So it was probably closer to 150 kilometers for a trip. And contrary to popular belief, there is no evidence that she traveled on a donkey either. There's no donkey in the story. Perhaps she did. But if you've ever ridden on a donkey, I think I would rather walk. So with thinking about the trouble that they went through and a lot of the saints of the New Testament and the Old Testament, let's look at what Apostle, the Apostle Peter said about joy. He says basically the same thing that, that James says. Trials and troubles in life can result in joy. Does that even make sense? There's a connection in this passage that I'd like to point out. And it's probably the root of the reason why trials bring joy. The connection in the, the, this passage is faith. Peter said, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Since we know that we must please God in order to be rewarded with joy, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that faith, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So it is faith, so it is faith that's required for joy. That's one thing that's required. Faith is the opposite of fear. Joy is the reward for victory over fear. So it stands to reason that we must have joy if we have faith. The two are inseparable. Think about that for a minute. Faith brings joy because a person who trusts God recognizes that the circumstances of this world are temporary. No matter how bad things get, there is eventual release from the trial. It's all temporary. The trust that we have comes with the reward, and Peter says that it's the salvation of our souls. There is a reward for perseverance. Peter says, along with salvation, praise and glory will be ours when Jesus returns. I don't know, does that help today when the trial is at its worst? When you're hurting the worst, does it help to know that sometime in the future, God will praise you for persevering that's hard to say because I'm not you but I hope so it does give me comfort and consolation when circumstances are difficult to bear too often people deny themselves permission to experience joy in their lives Debbie and I saw this so much in Celebrate Recovery People who have had amazing healing in them in their life, in their lives, and refuse to accept the actual gift. For whatever reason, it seems that they feel unworthy of God's love or receiving the joy that obedience to Him will bring. If you're having problems receiving joy in your life, ask God for help, and I know he will help you, but you have to, you have to accept it. You have to accept the gift. When you, when you yield to worship God with your songs, with your words and actions, you are indicating a need for him and recognizing the lordship that he has over your life. And as you open up to him, you are giving him authorization to fill you with joy. He won't just do it. 
You have to ask and you have to accept. So what is the joy of Christmas? I mean, after all, that's what we're here for, right? Beyond the obviousness of the birth of Jesus, is there any more? I mean, that's a fairly important thing. Let's just look briefly beyond that night and the implications of an earthly life that was born that night. Let's look beyond the shepherds and the wise men and even the backstory. Let's see what it actually means to you, what the joy of Christmas actually means to you. Tozer said, A.W. Tozer said, Christ came to bring peace and we celebrate by uh, his coming by making peace impossible for six weeks of each year. This was written many years ago, by the way. <laughs> it's probably even longer than that now. He came to help the poor and we heap gifts upon those who don't need them. Okay. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, for the great and powerful of this world, there are only two places in which their courage fails them, of which they are afraid deep down in their souls, from which they shy away. These are the manger of Jesus and the cross of Jesus Christ. No powerful person dares approach the manger. Even King Herod, remember? You go and find him, he said. And he continues, for this is where thrones shake, the mighty fall, the prominent perish, because God is with the lowly. Here the rich come to nothing because God is with the poor and hungry. But the rich and satisfied, he sends away empty. Before Mary, the maid, before the manger of Christ, before God in lowliness, the powerful come to nothing. They have no right, no hope. They are judged. Unquote. That's what it meant to two Christian philosophers. What does it mean to you? Do you agree with these men or do you have a different opinion? The Gospel of John, yeah, yeah, I'm jumping around a little bit. Hey, it's all over the place. The Gospel of John does not record the birth of Jesus, does it? It's possible that by the time John wrote his record, the story of Christmas was already well known and it didn't need to be repeated. But he did say something that indicates the momentous nature of the event. He said, the word became flesh and lived among us and we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father. So embodied in that infant born of poor and lowly parents is the joy of Christmas. When Jesus was born, God had been silent through his prophets for 400 years. I would think the people of Israel may have thought that God had forgotten his people. God had not forgotten. Apostle Paul stated that Jesus came when the time was right. God had not forgotten. He's not forgotten you either, or me. John said, we beheld his glory. The apostle testified to the fact that he was a witness of the life of Jesus. Peter, who was also another witness, tells us that our faith is based on trusting God. See, Peter respected the Christian who had never seen Jesus even more than himself. Even though we have never seen him, he said, we still trust him. Peter and John actually saw him. They talked with him. They, they walked with him. They ate with him. So verse 12 brings us back to Christmas and to the joy it brings. 
It's also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. There are five appearances of angels that surround the Christmas story. There's no other event recorded in the Bible that has so many appearances of angels. When Jesus died, there was only two, maybe three, that surrounded his death, burial, and resurrection. His birth is greeted by five. So Peter wrote, so be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. God has not forgotten. You are on his heart always. There's wonderful joy ahead. Father, thank you that you can fill us with joy. And even though there might be difficult times now and in the future, our faith helps us to go beyond those things and understand that these things are just happening for a short time and then they'll be over. And even though other trials might come, we know that those are temporary too. Help us through this sadness, through the sorrow, and help us to have a full joy, that inexpressible joy that joy that is even hard to understand by most. In Jesus' name, amen.